2020 with the first prayer by our trustee, Lynn McAllister. Thank you, Lynn. Eternal God, amidst the current dark reality, keeping our hope is a challenge. We wonder how to have hope. Even more difficult, how to speak of hope to the farmer facing the bulldozer, to the mother who lost her son to arms, to the families divided under the walls of shame. And yet none of us has the luxury of despair. We are defeated the moment we surrender to the dark realities around us and forget to turn to you, O oh God, and ask that you act through us to bring justice and peace to this troubled land. Bless us with the hope that has the capacity to see you in the midst of trouble. The hope that enables us to be co-workers with the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Let us not fall into the false hope of passive waiting or chasing after illusions. Bless us with the hope that arouses a passion for the possible, a true hope that is active, that is something we practice, something we live, something we plant like a seed. Because if we do not plant today, there will not be anything for tomorrow. We give thanks for Jesus, the ultimate giver of hope who then and now shows us the way and calls us to be his body in the world, countering evil with justice, hate with love, death and deadliness with life in all its fullness, and overcoming fatalism with hope for a world reborn. Amen. Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census, a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Good afternoon, everyone very pleased to be with you as part of this Advent service. And I'll be introducing four songs today, and all of them will have at least choruses, so you can join in and the words will come up on the screen. You can sing in the privacy of your room. There's also a traditional carol amongst them, which you will know anyway. First song's called Bethlehem is Calling, and the chorus says this, here it comes from Bethlehem. Bow down low, start again, as a humble, generous God stops to show us the way of love from Bethlehem. <laughs> Yeah. 
Heavy hands come quietly through the season's noise, whispering of the conspiracy of love. Here it comes, the news of love, the birth of God's new way of love, breaking through the darkness, bringing light. Our second reading comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, 
do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The next song is Silent Night. The words won't come up, as I'm sure you know it or you know a version of it. It's a clip from a Christmas concert in Reapham Lincoln, and I have fiddle player Chris Rogers joining me on this one.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. I am thankful to friends of Sabil and Kairos, UK, for inviting me to preach. It's a privilege to be together virtually. I have entitled my sermon, God's Good News for Peace. In order to understand the impact of the words good news, we only need to remember when a few weeks ago, we heard Pfizer's announcement that its vaccine for the coronavirus was ready for use. We knew that the medical scientists have been working diligently for several months to produce a vaccine. But when the news came, it was indeed good news to all the people of the world. Notwithstanding the tragic deaths of hundreds of thousands of people across the world. At Christmas time, we are reminded of the good news which God sent to a group of simple shepherds 2000 years ago, as they were watching their flocks at night near the town of Bethlehem, Palestine, in an isolated corner of the world that was living under the occupation of the Roman Empire. An angel of the Lord said to the shepherds, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. Then there was a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill among people. As followers of Jesus Christ, we believe that the good news of the heavenly chorus is tantamount to God's formula for peace. It includes, it includes three essential prerequisites that make peace on earth possible. First, the heavenly chorus said, glory to God in the highest. God's glory is linked to God's power. Giving glory to God means acknowledging that to God alone belongs power and greatness, worship and majesty. For peace to be established, power is needed. God's power, however, is linked to God's nature and God's nature is love. Therefore, God's power that is needed for making peace is God's power of love. The danger is, however, how do people understand power today? The two most, so, most common sources of power in our world are military power and the power of riches and wealth. Whereas human power is measured by the number of army tanks and fighter planes that can conquer and destroy or by the wealth and riches which some people of power can use to exploit, control and dehumanize others, God's power is measured by God's power to effect forgiveness, to restore wholeness and healing, to comfort and strengthen the brokenhearted and the sorrowful and to transform structures of domination to structures of peace and justice. Having said that, we need to admit that even in the Bible, we find some confusing words about power. In some Old Testament texts, God is pictured as a male God of war who goes with his Israelite tribes to war to fight their battles 
and plunder other people's land and property. There are texts that reflect a God who encouraged his people to steal and rob others, as we read in the book of Exodus. There are biblical texts that reflect a violent God who mandated his people to drive out the native indigenous inhabitants of Palestine and even to utter and exterminate them as we read in the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy. God's power in those primitive times was expressed through acts of war, violence, and ethnic cleansing. Such exclusive picture of God is repugnant to morality and human decency and is contrary to the picture of God we have seen in Jesus Christ and thus it cannot be authoritative for us. It's important to remember, however, that such exclusive understanding of God was corrected in the Old Testament itself. A higher and a more mature understanding of God portrays God as the God of justice and mercy, the God of steadfast love and loving kindness, not only to ancient Israel, but to other people. Unfortunately, however, in some Old Testament texts, the picture of God kept vacillating between an inclusive and inclusive understanding of God's character. In the coming of Jesus Christ, we have come to know God as the God of love. And we have come to recognize that God's power is expressed in God's power of love. In order to avoid the confusion with human understanding of power that primarily includes war, violence, and destruction, the Christmas story points us to look at the baby in the manger. Looking at the baby Jesus in the manger and what this baby stands for gives us a revolutionary understanding of power that critiques human understanding of power. In the Christmas story, King Herod the Great epitomizes and exemplifies the worst expressions of people of power in the world then and now, who use power to exploit, dehumanize, and destroy others. While God's power of love is exemplified in the coming of Jesus Christ and in people of conscience and faith that express their use of power through love and compassion. Looking at the baby Jesus in the manger gives us a new and fresh perspective of God's power, which we must not confuse with worldly power. The baby in the manger reflects God's humility, God's humanity, God's love. Later on in his life and ministry, Jesus reflected God's power by his identification with the poor, the needy, and the marginalized. In Jesus Christ, the glory of God was expressed in Christ's sacrificial love through his death on the cross and his resurrection. So when we say glory to God in the highest, we are speaking about God's power of love. God's power is never coercive. It is likened to the unconditional love of parents for their children. God in Jesus Christ must, must always be the model and the paradigm of true and genuine power. And we humans must imitate and practice God's understanding of power in our relationship with others in the world. Therefore, the first prerequisite for peace is glory, is giving glory to God, which practically means having the power of God working through us in peacemaking. This understanding of power that is founded on giving God the glory can be the force that enables and emboldens us in the work of peace on earth. 
The second prerequisite is peace itself. As glory to God is linked to God's power, peace on earth is linked to the doing of justice. But what do we mean by peace? Military generals argue that peace can be imposed through war. The army goes in, vanquishes the enemy, and drives out the dictator and restores peace. The tolls of war, of wars that we have experienced during our lifetime have been heavy with the death of many innocent people. Nowadays, we recognize that peace cannot prevail unless we deal with the underlying injustices and with the systems of domination and corruption whether economic, political, or religious, that need to be changed and transformed. Although the biblical injunctions for justice are still important, like the words of Amos, let justice run like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, or words, the words of Micah, what does the Lord require of us to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, I find greater help and frankly, greater clarity and, and influence nowadays when I refer to justice as expressed in international law, especially when the international community enforces it. When I consider the need for justice, I think of my Palestinian people who have been crying out for justice for over 70 years. I pray and advocate for justice for them in accordance with international law. This means the ending of the illegal Israeli occupation and the establishment of a sovereign Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. This Palestinian state is to be established on the West Bank the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem as its capital. What has been lacking is the will of the international community to implement the demands of justice. Less than a month ago, the United Nations General Assembly's third committee, which deals with human rights and humanitarian affairs, voted overwhelmingly to approve a draft resolution in favor of Palestinian self-determination. The end of the Israeli occupation and the right for the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. The vote was 163 for and five against and the five included Israel and the United States. For over 70 years, Israel flouted international law and was backed up by the United States. Such a stance by Israel and the United States makes a mockery of justice. If I am to speak the truth in love, my friends, I say to you candidly that the burden, historically speaking, for the failure of the implementation of international law regarding Palestine, to a large extent, falls on the shoulders of Britain and the United States that share a special responsibility vis-a-vis -vis Palestine and Israel. Both countries have led the way for doing justice, should, for both countries should have led the way for doing justice and achieving peace, but they lacked the will to do it. It is important to remember that the Palestinian tragic Nakba began under the watch of the British mandatory government. Britain bears responsibility. And it is time for Britain to take the lead for justice. 
in the virtual conference organized by the Balfour Project last October. It was heartening to hear a number of British parliamentarians and members of the House of Lords calling for the recognition of the state of Palestine and speaking about Palestinian rights. It is time to move from words to actions. It is time to move from resolutions to implementations. It is time to do justice for the Palestinians. It is time to stop the illegal confiscation of Palestinian land and the expansion of the illegal Israeli settlements. It is time for the British government and the new American government to lead the way with courage and determination and enforce the resolutions of international law. The daily suffering and oppression of our Palestinian people under the Israeli occupation is unbelievable and cannot be imagined. And the situation is getting worse. Many of you, my friends, have visited Palestine and have seen the oppressive occupation with your own eyes. It needs to stop. The international community is ready. Britain and the United States can do it. How long should the oppressed Palestinians wait? My friends, let us remember that issues of justice and peace are at the heart of the business of the church. Our church leadership must take a more courageous stance on behalf of the oppressed Palestinians who seek liberation and the restoration of their God-given human dignity. The church has a responsibility before its Lord to speak prophetically against the grave injustice. Let us remember that we are indeed children of God when we are engaged in peacemaking. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. I realize that I am speaking about the Palestinians, but there are many other people of the world who are also crying for justice. For some, it is economic justice, political justice, social justice, racial justice, or environmental justice, and many other forms of justice. We also stand with them. Implementing justice on the basis of international law can contribute to the achievement of peace and well-being for many people. As Christians, it is essential to emphasize that the doing of justice must always be tempered with mercy and compassion. The third prerequisite for peace in God's formula is goodwill among people. Goodwill is linked to love. As glory to God is linked to power and peace is linked to justice and mercy, goodwill is linked to the love of neighbor. But here again, we need a new understanding of love. The word love has become a very ordinary word and we use it to express everything we like. At a deeper level, however, it must go beyond human emotions to reflect genuine love of others in caring and helping others in need, especially during these days of pandemic, when many people have lost their jobs. I have seen this genuine love expressed during the Advent and Christmas season in the, generous, in the generous generosity of many American churches and NGOs in giving food for the hungry and needy. I watched on TV the long lines of people waiting to receive help. If this is true in the United States, the richest country in the world, how much more it is true in many other countries of the world. Christ teaches us 
that when we offer help to the needy, we are offering it to Jesus Christ himself. Genuine love is free and inclusive as God's love is free and inclusive. We must be imitators of God's love to the world through Jesus Christ. Goodwill involves loving relationship and respect for others. Goodwill among people can be achieved when genuine love is shared and practiced. Dear brothers and sisters, Christmas is a time that makes us think of peace on earth because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And with his coming, God has sent us the formula for peace. It includes, as we have seen, giving God the glory as expressed in God's power of love and peace based on justice and compassion and goodwill expressed in genuine love for others. As millions of people around the world are being inoculated by the vaccine against COVID-19, giving them hope and a healthier life, may we at this Christmas time be injected by the reviving and living spirit of Christ that renews our hope and strengthen our commitment to the ministry of justice. It is the doing of justice that produces peace and peace that opens the door for goodwill, for reconciliation and healing. Let us continue to walk together, dear brother and sisters, and be engaged together in this noble ministry for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Palestine. And may the spirit and peace of Christ at this Christmas time abide with us throughout the coming new year. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Nick, um, Naeem. This song picks up on that theme of justice. It's called Light a Candle in the Darkness. And I have a few versions of this song, but this one is the Rachel Corey version. You will remember she was killed by an Israeli bulldozer in Gaza, trying to protect a Palestinian home. I adapted the song for her memorial service. The song starts with a verse about Martin Luther King, then one on Oscar Romero, and then Rachel Corey. It's a reminder for each of us to light candles for justice to be candles lit for justice. The words will be there for the chorus. Light a candle in the dark.
living down in God. Rage go calling to the stand. Many thanks for that, Garth. Another wonderful reminder of justice and peace and how we can be a light in this world for those who are suffering and those who are in pain. And our real incredible thanks to you, Reverend Naeem, for another wonderful address. Every time I hear you, I learn something new. I'm challenged in a new way. I'm inspired in a new way. And we are so grateful to you for joining us today. It's, it's just wonderful to have you with us. We're going to move on now to our action together, um, which today is to light a candle. And as we do this, Scarth will be leading us in a prayer. But whilst you're getting your candle now, and whilst you're striking your match, I'd like you to just hold in your mind um, the people of Palestine, the friends that you know there, the organisations that have worked tirelessly all these years for justice, all of those who work both here in the UK and across the world, to bring about a light in the darkness and to work and strive together for peace for all in the Holy Land. So let's gather our candles, let's strike the match, be that light for 2021 um, and make a difference in our world. And then Garth will lead us in a prayer. This prayer is called, Here God is at Home. Oh God, today we've been reminded, I just ask that the bits in bold that you join in. Thank you. Oh God, today we've been reminded that we too should be like candles shining for justice. We should be the community that refuses to be silent. Be silent about the Palestinians of Bethlehem. Of Gaza, of the West, of the West Bank, Bank, of Israel, of Israel. and refugee camps across. Yeah. Reveals something special. It reveals that you are the God with such a precious love for humanity. humanity. So we, so we must cherish human rights. human rights. You are the God of humility, made visible in the ordinary person 
in the everyday ordinariness of life. You are the God of the forgotten and the insignificant. And therefore, and therefore there is hope for us all, 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 as we do, as we do show how to, how to live. To live. And you're the God of Bethlehem today. You would choose it again, precisely because the world thinks it is insignificant and its people have no value. So the angels would sing again to say, to say Dear Dear God, is God, is God, 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 the wise would be surprised again, saying, Dear God, 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 is God, 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 and shepherds and carpenters making olive wood gifts and tour guides and drivers of coaches for pilgrims. In a year, in a year when there are no pilgrims. pilgrims. The innkeepers and all the community, women, children and men, crushed, humiliated, invaded and imprisoned, under occupation and under lockdown, can stand up tall with confidence and proclaim, Here God, God is at home. Because you've shown your character in Bethlehem, You've affirmed humanity in Bethlehem, and still do today. And that is the message of Christmas. Bethlehem, Bethlehem is not forgotten. Our Palestine is not forgotten. Here, 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 here God, God is, is at home. As, as, as we take our stand, stand of solidarity, solidarity in the Palestinian community, may we never be silent. Our churches never be silent. God is at home. Our churches never be silent. God is at home. Our churches never be silent. 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 Well, thank you um, very much there, Garth, for that prayer. This is Mark speaking, the um, chair of the board of trustees of Sabeel Kairos. I just would like to offer my thanks to Naeem and to all our readers, Naeem particularly for the inspiration of his words. While we have been involved in this wonderful Christmas service, I have received a private message to say that if we are able to raise anything up to £5,000 from today, then I have an anonymous donor who will match us pound for pound. So if you feel able, so we can share all of that with uh, both the money and so on with, with um, Sibyl Jerusalem in whatever way is the best way to do this. Um, and Naeem will advise us as will Omar in Jerusalem about how the best way to, uh, to, to use the funds. Um, but just to say that anything you're able to give, as Charlotte said at the beginning, now is the time to do it, because up to £5,000 we can get match funding from a very, very generous supporter of our, uh, of our organisations, and most importantly, a generous supporter of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. So please do dig deep, think carefully, perhaps use some of this money we've saved this year by not being able to go out to give to those who can never go out. Uh, in the same way. So God bless to that uh, individual donator and thank you for that. So um, we're going to pass back over to Garth and have his final song, after which we will just close the, the meeting. So over to you, Garth. Thank you. Our final song, Peace at Christmas. Song a part of broken land, let peace come down this Christmas time and let's all take a stand.
Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Garth, thank you to Nay, and Naeem, and thank you to all of those that have been involved. Just very quick, quickly, a lot of you have been asking for the prayers, uh, for the sermon. We have recorded the event, so we will send you out a link to that, but we will also do our best to get hold of a, a paper copy, um, a hard copy of, of all the things that have been shared today, including the prayers and Naeem's address, so that we can share those with you too. And so please give us a, a little bit of time to get that organised, but that will come to you early in the new year. And if you do have a chance to donate to us, please head to our website. It's just www.sabilkairos.org.uk slash donate and you can do that safely and securely online it uh, just remains for us to say have a very peaceful joyful blessed christmas it's been wonderful to have 2020 with you and we look forward to joining you in events like this and hopefully face to face once more in 2021 stay safe and thank you very much for being with us today goodbye thank you god bless thank you. Bye. Thank god bless you. everybody bye -bye. god bless bye-bye Bye-bye. Okay.